Welcome back, listeners, to episode 110 of Sitcom Showdown. I'm Steve. Hello, I'm Jeff. Yep. Mm. We're back, and I've chosen something to talk about today. It's Up Pompeii. This is a British television series, a comedy series set in ancient Pompeii, as Mm -hmm. you might have guessed, and it was broadcast between 69 and 70. So quite old by our standards, I would think. It's probably only a couple older than that that we've done. Yeah. Hancock. and Hancock. Right, well, let me give you a bit of background to this this sitcom. So it started with a Stephen Sondheim musical called A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Forum. This was a a musical telling the baldy story of a slave named Sudeless and his attempts to win his freedom by helping his young master woo the girl next door. It was presented twice in the West End. Right. So it started on Broadway. So, it went, But it ran twice in the West End of London. There was a 1963 production, which is probably the most interesting to us, but there was also a 1986 revival, and they both starred Frankie Howard as Sudeless. Mm. Mm. So uh, two execs from the BBC, Michael Mills and Tom Sloan, they had seen this musical and then they went on a trip to Pompeii. And as their... <laughs> oh, the taxpayer's expense? Oh, or? <laughs> it was probably research. Okay, right. Totally right, right. legit. Okay, cool. Uh, as they're doing the rounds of the, the ruins of Pompeii, uh, one of them remarks to the other that they're half expecting to see Frankie Howard no. pop up around the corner and start doing his thing. Anyway, the other guy said, well, why not? And then the idea got some legs and they cast Frankie in the lead role. Mm. Mm. And um, a guy called Talbot Rothwell was invited to write a script, which came, became the pilot mm. of Up Pompeii. Uh-huh. And that appeared in the Comedy Playhouse series. Right. I'm not I couldn't remember if we talked about the Comedy Playhouse before. Nope. But it's um a long running BBC anthology of one off sitcoms that totaled hundred and twenty eight episodes from sixty one to seventy five and then a whole load of these essentially pilot episodes then went on to become successful sitcoms. Mm. Uh, in all, 27 of the sitcoms that were featured on Comedy Playhouse went on to be commissioned for a proper series. Right. Including Steptoe and Son, The Live of Birds, Are You Being Served? and The Last of the Summer Wine. Very famous ones. Uh, yeah, so in, in this case, it was followed up with two series of Up, up Pompeii, which aired from yeah, between 69 and 70, like we already said. Yeah, I just want to note that most of the actors who were in the pilot carried over to the, the proper series. Oh, okay. Mm. So I just want to come back to the scriptwriter, Talbot. He wrote the first series of Up Pompeii by himself. Now, he'd been a scriptwriter for the Carry On films. And then in the second series of Up Pompeii, he was joined by a guy called Sid Collin. And he was well known for having created the sitcom The Army Game for Granada oh, Television. Now, was that William Hartnell? Yes, that's right, Jeff. Uh, featured William Hartnell. And yes, that ran for four series, totaling 154 episodes. Colin wrote 38 of the Army Game episodes. Oh, crikey, mm. okay. So, the, yep, there was a solid script writing team behind this show. And then in terms of production, David Croft and Sidney Lotterby produced and directed Up Pompeii. Yes. Sidney Lotterby, very famous for his work on the goodies, and David Croft... Oh, yeah. What, what can't you say about David Croft? Blimey. Well, he had a very successful partnership with both Jimmy Perry and Jeremy Lloyd. Mm. And, of course, they did things like Dad's Army and Are You Being Served? As then, we're going to find out, Steve-O, there's mm, yeah. uh, your occasional crossover with mm. Dad's Army going out at this time. Yep. And up Pompeii, mm. for sure. Yep. And then Sidney Lotterby, uh, as you said, he's he produced or directed quite a lot of things like... As Time Goes By, Last of the Summer Wine, Yes Minister and Yes Prime Minister, oh. Brush Strokes, Open All Hours, Ripping Yarns, Porridge Going Straight, and the final series of Some Mothers Do Have Them. Right. Mm. We are going to have to put a pin in Brush Strokes. It's something we always keep threatening yeah. to, to do, and we've, we've not done it. And in fact, just to take us down a completely separate tangent, Steve, and you yep. just brought up Porridge, I learned today while listening to an episode of Goon Pod that... <laughs> Porridge had an American counterpart, mm. and so they'd written the first series of Porridge, and apologies if I get some of this wrong, and so then 
having written the first series of Porridge, went over to America and did the American Porridge, which, of course, they do more episodes over there. So when mm. they came to the second series of Porridge here, they used the scripts they'd written for the American oh, one. Cool. And I just, that blew my mind. And it's, yeah. I wonder if you can find that Clip. on YouTube or something. Oh, right. The Yeah, okay. The American Porridge. Yeah, what would it have been called over there? Well, Pre- right. <laughs> We're five minutes in and we've already had two really good <laughs> ideas for future episodes. That's cool. That we'll never get around to. Oh, no, we will. Okay, cool. In episode 180 of Sitcom Show. Yeah. 180. Mm. So, but then this is not the whole story, right? Because after the first, these two series, normal kind of series, if you like, of uh, Pompeii, two specials were transmitted in 75 and 91. What? And a film adaption was done as well in 71. Oh, my goodness. Okay. Yeah. Oh, it keeps going. It keeps going. Um, there were two other films, Up the Chastity Belt. And... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And Up the Front. Right, which transported the character to medieval times in World War One. Oh my God, is Blackadder? And I thought this War sounds exactly like Blackadder. Holy moly! Where essentially the same character or very similar character wow. is transplanted to a whole different time frame. This is blowing my mind. Mm. And then the format of Up Pompeii also inspired two later TV series, Whoops Baghdad. Oh yes, and another one called Then Churchill Said to Me, both starring Frankie Howard. Holy crap, okay. So he's got a lot of credits. Yeah, so yeah. what I want to know, Steve, which I'm sure you'll tell us when you get on to him, is that was before Up Pompeii, was he famous on TV or in movies and oh, yeah. or radio? We'll get on to that in a second. Okay, cool. But before we do... We haven't finished with, as the, you say, um, Talbot. Uh, Talbot. I know, just these um, well, spin-offs or whatever you want to call them. Yeah. The one then Churchill said to me that from 1982, that was shelved due to the outbreak of the Falklands War but eventually got aired after Frankie Howard's death in 93. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, I thought he died in 92. You can't believe everything or even anything you read online. It says, right. according to my okay. highly reputable sources. Wouldn't it be funny if the, the Wikipedia page about the show said 93 and the Wikipedia page about Frankie said 92? Mm. Yeah, talk about mixed messages. Um, Before we move on to the mighty Frankie Howard, and while we're still on Talbot Ruffer, um. So much like a lot of people who produced great series in the 60s and 70s, he was in World War Two. Yes. Uh, were you going to bring this up, were you? No, no, but I just noticed, well, was, I got onto the actors that oh, yeah, yeah. many of them... Were you going to mention Peter Butterworth? Got a start in entertainment during World War Two. Ah, mm. so he was in a prisoner of war camp with Peter Butterworth. Oh, really? Yeah, which is amazing. And Peter Butterworth, we know, is the meddling monk from Doctor Who. Uh, mm. In series two of Doctor Who in 1965. Yeah. And so him and Talbs were in the prisoner of war camp together and then got into entertaining, you know, yep. their fellow prisoners and all this huh. sort of stuff, which I, I found amazing. So there we yeah. go. Mm. Talbot Rothwell, it's a cracker of a name, isn't it? It is. But yeah, well, this um, spin off discussion has not finished because a pilot episode for a US version of Up Pompeii for ABC, initially called The Pompeii Way, but later renamed Up the Toga. And still starring Frankie Howard and co-starring Foster Brooks. This was recorded in 71, but it did not proceed to a full series and was never shown. Is someone going to leak that onto YouTube? No. Well, in fact, people didn't even know this was a thing until this photo became discovered online and uh, kind of sparked some interest in what happened and when it was all unearthed. It appears they found a 16mm film version of the... Of the pilot. Right. Eventually. And then up Pompeii itself, like many of the shows, as you know, Jeff, uh, had the original tapes wiped back in the day. Ooh. But they retrieved all the episodes from the Canadian Broadcasting Commission, the CBC archive, but they were in NTSC. <laughs> so, <laughs> yep. I what what it, year did they discover that? Do you know? Was it, Are we talking the mm, 90s or the 2000s? It or says the missing episodes were found in the late 70s. Wow. But it wasn't until the mid-2000s, that they switched it out, did the restoration or whatever you call the the conversion back mm. to PAL, yep. as it should be, and then it made its way to DVD. Far I think out. Doctor Who kind of, well, they pioneered all that stuff on yeah, the Doctor, Doctor Who, Who restoration and team. We've, rolled it out to yeah. other things as well. And you can find a lot of Up Pompeii on YouTube, and there's one playlist that pretty much has the whole lot in it, so... Shouldn't be too hard to find listeners if you're wanting to track it down. That's where we watched it on. Yeah, that's right. Whew. Now we're going to move on to the actors, and there's some 
there's some good stuff here, including the guests in this episode. So let's make a start with Frankie Howard. He's uh, starring as the slave Lurkio. By the way, the names in this show tell you something about the characters, so you need to pay some attention to those. Uh huh. And I think the... I don't know if this inspired Monty Python to take things a step further when they did um, Life of Brian. But, you know, the Romans had... <laughs> yeah, the famous Biggest Dickest. Yes. Yeah. Quite That's extravagant him. names. That's one of Jane's favourite exactly. laugh-a-minute moments from her childhood. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so back to Frankie Howard. Uh, like we said, there's all these entertainers who made their start during World War Two, and he was one of them. So he began to entertain during World War Two, and uh, while he was in service in the British Army, he apparently suffered from some stage fright, but he did continue to work after the war, and he began his professional career in the summer of 46 in a touring show, which was called For the Fun of It. And then he moved on to radio, making his debut in early December 46, and his profile rose in the, the period after that, and he worked... Some of the material he, he worked with was written by Eric Sykes, Galton and Simpson nice. and others. So brilliant quality, quality stuff there. And then in 54, he made his stage, de- uh, sorry, his screen debut and experimented with a number of different formats and contexts, including stage farces, Shakespearean comedy roles and television sitcoms. And then we've already discussed how his um, a funny thing happened on the way to the forum led into regular television work for him. Uh, just a couple of other things on that. In 66 and 67, he hosted a 90-minute Christmas show called The Frankie and Bruce Christmas Show with Bruce Forsyth. Oh, Brucey. Okay. Well, I'll just <laughs> mention Brucey. So wow. He was, he was in there. My favourite mm. fact about Brucey is that, you know, as far as television appearances go, it's the longest because he first appeared in his very, very young years, you know, childhood, basically yep. in the 30s, and then he was still hosting. Mm-hmm stuff up until what I'd call recently, but other people might call ancient history. In the 2000s. Well mm. into the 2000s, wasn't it? Mm. Yep. Enough of Brucey. We've got to talk about Frankie. Oh, I keep forgetting. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to mention a couple of his trademark things, which are relevant to this, um, this episode we're going to be talking about and to Up Pompeii. Uh, his television work was characterised by direct addresses to camera and by his littering... Mo- he littered his monologues with verbal tics such as, ooh, no misses, and titty you not. And another feature of his humour was to feign innocence about his obvious and risque double entendres while mockingly censoring the audience for finding them funny. Yeah. yeah. He's trying yeah. to get ahead of it. It's a fantastic time-honoured technique. Mm. What about some of the other cast, though? Lurkio's bumbling old master, Ludicrous Sextus. Right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, he was played by Max Adrian. Max was an Irish stage, film and television actor and singer. A character actor, uh, singer and comic actor, founding member of both the Royal Shakespeare Company and the National Theatre. Don't you know? Okay. As part of John Gilgood's company at the Haymarket Theatre in the mid-1940s, he played Puck in A Midsummer's Night Dream. So can you guess how that might be relevant to Uh, the episode we're talking about, Jeff? No, I'm no Shakespeare expert. Okay, so, well, you will... I'm going to mention something in a minute. Potions and stuff? Yes, so that's right. Okay, jolly good. So... Puck serves the fairy king Oberon. Oberon is angry with Titania, the fairy queen, because she will not let him have a particular little changeling boy. Oberon sends Puck to fetch a particular flower, whereof the juice on sleeping eyelids laid will make a man or woman madly dote upon the next live creature that it sees. Oh. I.e. a love potion. Puck is told to apply it to the disdainful youth. Um, yeah, and so on and so on it goes. But yes, um, this Shakespeare play has an obvious influence, not only on this episode, but especially Upstart Crow yeah. and the episode Lord What Fools These Mortals Be, which is all about the... It's the true story of how yeah. Shakespeare wrote A Midsummer's Night Dream. The great show, Upstart Crow. Mm, it's very good. A lot more could be said about Max's career, but there's no time, Jeff. We've got to keep going. No, of course not. Uh, he passed away in 1973, not long after Up Pompeii. Cool. And at his memorial service, the great names of British theatre paid tribute to his style and professionalism, Mm. including Alec Guinness and Laurence Olivier. Right. Mm. That's not to be sneezed at. Absolutely not. Ludacris's promiscuous wife is Ammonia, played by Elizabeth Lana. 
an actress and singer with a powerful soprano voice. And her main career was in musical theatre. And she appeared in both the West End and on Broadway. Hmm. The daughter, Erotica, was played by Georgia Moon. A lovely Georgina. Appears to have been of a younger generation than the people we've already talked about. Mm -hmm. So hers is mostly TV work. She did 29 episodes of the Yorkshire television sitcom You're Only Young Twice. Oh, okay. Have you heard of that one? It's one we've brought up while talking about other sitcoms. Okay. I've never seen it. No. Mm. Okay. Yeah, that was a comedy about the residents of Paradise Lodge. Oh. A retirement home for gentlefolk. Also, 13 episodes of How you, How's Your Father? Carry On Behind. <laughs> I told you the Carry On movie is going to keep coming back. Yeah. Uh, Carry On Camping. And she was in a show called UFO. Right. Or UFO. Mm. Yeah, no, I love that show. It was great. It was like a Jerry Anderson kind of yeah. a, a deal. Mm. Also, there's the virginal son, Norseus, played by Kerry Gardner. Uh, Kerry became, soon after uh, Pompeii, became an actor's and writer's agent in 73, co-founding the company Gardner Herity with Andy Herity. So mm. there's not a lot of information about um, Kerry's acting, but he did. I noticed that he did publish a memoir a couple of years ago, so if people are interested, they might want to check that out. That's bound to have lots of really good gossip in it, I, I reckon. Would, I would think so. Particularly if you've been an agent, you would have for, yeah. I don't know, 30 or 40 years. Like filthy oh, mouth. The stories you could tell. Yeah. Hmm. He's probably got the dirt. Yeah. The dirt and the goss on everyone. On everybody. Yeah. Okay, so now the uh, the guest stars in this episode. Firstly, we've got Linda Barron Ooh. as Ambrosia. Yep. Uh, of course, Herself a fantastic singer as well. Hmm. Mm. Yes. And, uh, of course, she's best known for playing Glurse, Nurse Gladys in Open All Hours and Still Open All Hours. Yep. And seems to have made guest appearances on pretty much everything on TV. Yeah. And bringing it back to Doctor Who, she was in, you know, The Gunfighters and she sang the infamous song at the Last Chance Saloon that everyone hates when they talk about The Gunfighters ah. with William Hartnell. And she sang that and she would have been, oh, blimey, you know, well, about five years before this, I dare say, or maybe five or six Early years 20s. before this. Yeah, yeah. Because she, I think she's 30 in this. Mm. There uh, so it's great to see her here. And then we've got... John Ring. Are we going to discuss the outfits when the time comes? Because oh, Linda's got we'll discuss whatever like, you want. virtually, you know, she's virtually, she's um, completely covered up from the waist up. Mm. But like the, the skirt is so short as to not even be a skirt, basically. Well, you can see your undies. Yeah, you can see it. Well, yeah. To the point, I don't think they're even undies because they they match perfectly the waistcoat and all the, yeah. Anyway. Mm. Well, no, I wasn't saying, complaining. That, are you saying that's a bad thing? No. <laughs> I wouldn't be foolish enough to say that. Okay. John Ringham plays Buntus. Uh, so this guy, I recognised him, but I couldn't, going through the mental exercise of trying to figure out where I'd mm. seen him all these times before, no, it was, that was a waste of time. Couldn't do it. Um, could have been three appearances that he made in Doctor Who. And then other things he's done over the years include Poldark, War and Peace, Birds of a Feather, The Bill, uh, Minder, All mm. Creatures Great and Small, A Being Served, Dad's Army, you know, just... Those loads are the ones I was going to bring up. So in 69, he was in that first series of Dad's Army as a mm -hmm. sort of posho right. dude. And he, you know, clearly they just thought the character didn't really work. So he never was brought back for the remaining series. Huh. Um, and very famously scary as hell in the Aztecs. Mm. In Doctor and you wouldn't recognize him, obviously, because he's got all the Feathers accoutrement mm. of being a nasty person who's the villain of the piece. But man, his if you look at his performance in the Aztecs, even to this day, he's just, oh man, he's scary as hell. Oof. He can do it all. He's Comedy. got the comedic range. And he's the... got the dramatic range. Yeah. yeah. All that stuff. Good o then, uh, and this is the last person we're going to mention in this section, Molly Sugden. Yes. Appears as Flavia. And she's best known as Mrs. Slocum, of course, on the British comedy A Being Served. Now, that's A Being Served started in 72, so this appearance in Up Pompeii is really just before things would have taken off for her, I think. Mm. Although she had done quite a bit of stuff beforehand, I found out. She did 33 episodes of Hugh and I, okay. which is a black and white British sitcom. It aired from 62 to 67, and a bit of Steptoe and Son and Coronation Street. And the goodies, apparently, as well. Yes. If I'm right, she was in one called The Playgirl Club. Playgirl Club. That was a, another cast member 
for this particular episode, Queenie, and mm. she was also in that episode, I believe. But I think I could be mixing up my goodies episodes. Right. Uh, but this was in season one or series one of the goodies, perhaps series two. So that's not one of the the it's more the, frequently revisited ones? No, and it was one that was only in black and white for a while, but now ah. there is a colour copy. So okay. that's pretty cool. Mm. Yeah, I hope I've remembered that right. Be embarrassing if I didn't. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so, you know, she is, she was in all sorts of stuff before Are You Being Served, but that really made her a household name. Mm. Mm-hmm. We've finished the cast now, so we can we can move cool. on to other things. Yeah, we can talk about some of the lesser drop-ins as as we move through the yeah. synopsis. Yeah, I have kind of sprinkled a bit of that as we mm. go through the synopsis. But... And I've already blown my Queenie Watts fact, so... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's all right. We've got, yeah. got that out of the way. Uh. So the love potion is this episode, and it was the seventh episode of Series 1, and it aired on May the 11th, 1970. Mm. So if we had recorded when we planned to record mm. instead of slightly later, we would have been recording this pretty much, you know, exactly 54 years after it could went been, out. Yeah, could have been the end of it. 54th anniversary. Yeah. Mm. Thanks. I'm your new next door neighbour, Lasha. Yeah, so nice to see you. Won't you lie down? I mean, won't you sit down? Thank you. <laughs> yes, oh dear, it'll be a piece of cake. This is going to be a piece of cake, don't worry. Yes, now watch this. Well, watch for a while, at any rate. But listen, no, as soon as I start to cut myself off a slice, you'll switch off, won't you? Promise you don't. Promise to switch off. Well, now, how nice. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, can I offer you just a tittle of wine? No, I don't think I really need it, thank you. No, I don't think she does either. <laughs> oh, it's going to be easy, this, or a piece of cake, yes. I expect you're wondering what I've come for. Oh, not really. <laughs> <laughs> so we open with a, a what I'm calling a, a very brief set of credits. Right, it really goes by in a bit of a flash, doesn't it? Mm. And then we, yeah, we're going to say something else. We're about to see a very brief pair of briefs. <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah, brief credits. And then we see Lurkio hanging out the washing in the street outside the house, and he appears from behind a pair of pink bloomers. Mm. <laughs> and then he goes, he goes through, and he's providing background information on each of the the pairs of undies on the line and who they belong to, and who, and... yeah, who they belong to, and. Yeah. When he gets to the, the smallest one, he says that this is essentially a converted eye patch. Yeah, okay. I'm Ball. just going to tick that off on my notes as one of the best lines of the... Yeah. And, and it's true. I like the whole conceit of it being washing day. So it gives him a, a jumping off point for the stand-up. It brightens up the set because there's a lot of grey and brown and mm. some nice pink really does stand out. Uh, and also it's a nice bit of prop comedy as well. So it's got so many uses, this thing, this whole washing day conceit, which isn't part of the plot. But you make it, it, you make it sound like you might have ad-libbed some of the... Do you reckon there was a lot of ad-libbing in this series? There probably would have been, you know. Could have been. Wouldn't surprise me if there was a few ad-libs in there. Anyway, um, back to this converted eye patch. This belongs to Erotica, the master's daughter. And yeah. when all the young men see her, they say, I, I, I. I, I? Oh. Um... It is really a tiny, tiny G-string, a tiny, tiny black G-string. Yeah, and what material there is is see-through. see-through. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. The prologue. So the, the prologue <laughs> is the prologue. The first, the first attempt at the prologue. Oh. This is a, a very Shakespearean thing to do. And he's what he's going to do is attempt to tell the story of Lysistrata. Now, Lysistrata was a bawdy Greek play by Arist- Aristophanes. Mm-hmm. But Hang course, on, is Aristophanes, isn't he, it? He, Aristophanes? Aristophanes? Because I get confused no, with Aristophanes. It's like Socrates. It's like saying Socrates instead of Socrates. Socrates. Yeah. <laughs> Him. All three yeah. of them. All the, you know, the listeners know who we're talking about. Yeah. Anyway, that's what he's trying to get to, but as usual... Europides instead of Europides. <laughs> Sorry, I'll stop this. Um, as usual, he gets interrupted, and on this occasion it's by Senna the Soothsayer, 
crying whoa whoa in the thrice bow <laughs> and we're going to have a little clip here oh, now listen are you t- oh, thrice whoa. oh dear now this is the soothsayer senna yeah. every time i see senna i want to run <laughs> Oh, yeah, what's that other town which was full of lectures and bibbers? Sodom. Yeah. <laughs> I know how she feels, mind you, but still. You lascivious, drooling sex pot. Oh, me? Yes, you. I've seen your greedy eyes devouring the tender flesh of women. Oh, you're, that's not true. I'm a vegetarian. What do you mean? <laughs> but judgment is at hand. Aphrodite, the goddess of love, will descend from the mountain in a flood of molten lava. Lava? Molten lava! Yes. And destroy you! Oh, yes, that'll be nice. When? She'll be coming down the mountain when she comes. <laughs> I suppose she'll be singing, Lava, come back to me. So her prediction wasn't wrong because, as we know, Pompeii was buried under four to six metres of volcanic ash in the eruption of Mount Vesuvius in 79 AD. Mm. But it doesn't happen immediately in this show anyway. No. Back to the story. Do we know when this is set, just out of interest? Uh, Roman times? Yeah. We don't so, know I mean, which emperor. Talking, you know, 500 BC or, you know, 10 years before Vesuvius in 69 AD, or I wonder, because there's quite yeah. a range, isn't there? Yeah, and it wouldn't have been 500 BC. Okay. Way too early, but... Right. Yeah. Fair enough. Mm. Lurkio is lamenting the wickedness and the depravity of Pompeii's inhabitants. Um, they only get married so they have someone to swap, <laughs> apparently. Then he sees his new neighbour, Lushia, played by Aussie actress Trisha Noble. And when he sees her, he does a bit of coveting, Jeff. Right. Uh, and as we know, you shouldn't do that. But he laments that he stands no chance with her because he's only a slave, of course. And his sad thoughts are interrupted mm. by nauseous coming out of the house. Right. And he's also feeling a bit low. And uh, what ails him? He's full of ale. No. <laughs> he's blabbing the poor little blubber. He's having a whale of a time. These oh, are the kind of the- <laughs> this is the thing about this show, and it is in my notes. To, we should talk about this at the end, but there's so many different types of gags, and then some of them just are absolute dad joke territory. Yeah, and but the funny of- thing is, <clears throat> when it's one of the dad jokes, he goes, yeah, yeah, I know, it's not very good, <laughs> you know. Even at the he end, he says, a... they get all the good lines, I just get the corny stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, that's good. Anyway, he's um, he's upset because his father wants to arrange a marriage for him with Grotia, but he wants Ambrosia. So he's in love with another another lady. And then as part of this conversation, I think it's Lokio says, let's say intuition, and then they turn to the... <laughs> turn to the camera together and go, intuition. Intuition, yeah. Oh, that reminds me of... Oh. I've seen something like that before. I'm going to have to cross this one off my notes. It's oh, no. one of the great gags. No, it just goes to show that, you know, the, the hits are hitting for both of us. So that's mm. pretty cool. You're I crossing that off? I that off. Yes, okay. absolutely. Another one um, that's good here while they're describing the girl. Uh, yeah, Ambrosia. It could be Grottier because they're saying that, you know, she's got a lovely part down the center of her hair and he's saying, but it's all on her chest or something like that. <laughs> And um, the the youngster is saying she carries all before her, and Frankie, well, sorry, Lurkio said she she carries quite a lot behind her as well, and that, that's just brilliant because I think these days that would age very well. Because unlike back then, now it's extremely fashionable and desirable to have a a fair old whack of junk in the trunk, and that'd be a compliment these days mm. instead of a a nasty fat joke. Yeah, and and generally just the wordplay made me laugh. I thought that was great. Yep. Mm. And now we're going to have another clip. Nauseous has written an ode to Ambrosia. May I see your ode? Please. Yes. Oh, yes, it's quite a lengthy one, isn't it? Here we are. Ode. Ode to Ambrosia. Ode to Ambrosia. I love to kiss her golden hair. She sets me writing ditties. <laughs> Get ready, get ready. But most of all, I love to roam around her ample country estate. 
That's where I first saw her. Was it? Well, I know it doesn't rhyme, but you can't have it everywhere. No. <laughs> I can't even get it anyway. Never mind. <laughs> so Lurkio's solution to the young master's problem is to talk him into proposing to Ambrosia, so he rushes off to do that. Next, we hear Mistress Ammonia calling, but that's interrupted by a cutaway. I don't know what you made of this. But oh, to Willie. It was a bit confusing. Um, Willie, that's the actor. Yep. Mm-hmm. You He's just got a brilliant comedy face. Yeah, yeah, I totally recognise him, yeah. Mm. Oh, that's uh... cool. Anyway, uh, so it's a cutaway to... I thought it was a Zeus or Jupiter-like figure in the clouds, but su- supposedly this is the comic playwright Plautus. Right. Who died in 184 BC, uh, giving his thoughts to the the audience on Roman sexuality. That helps us place it, because if that's when he died and he's up there in heaven on a cloud with all mm. the ladies, is that how? Then it must what be we're supposed after. To be well, no, that's sort of where I got from, from it. Mm. That's my interpretation. So now we know it's between whatever number you said and 79 AD. Yep. Fantastic. Okay. Well done, Jeff. Thank you. Uh, we are going to go on a slight tangent now about Plautus. Because this playwright heavily influenced both A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Forum and Up Pompeii. Oh. Basically, both plots and devices were used. uh, And we're talking about things like the prologue and the clever slave device. Mm. And I've got a little quotey-poo from Wikipedia. Okay. The clever slave not only provides exposition and humor, but also often drives the plot in Plautus's plays. Stace, someone called Stace, argues that Plautus took the stock slave character from new comedy in Greece, so earlier comedies, and altered it uh, for his own purposes in Roman times. In new comedy, Stace writes that the slave is often not much more than a comedic turn with the added purpose, perhaps, of exposition. This shows that there was precedent for this slave archetype, and obviously some of its old role continues in Plautus, such as the expository monologues, For instance, however, what he did differently was uh, he found humour in slaves tricking their masters or comparing themselves to great heroes, and he took the character. So he took the character or the idea a step further and created something distinct, and we see that in Up Pompeii Mm. and the episode we're talking about. Um, So back to the action. Lurkio enters the house now because his mistress has been calling, and she announces that she's going to be going out for a bit. Who were? (laughs) <laughs> to a fabric making course oh uh, yes and in that case Ludacris says he'll go out too to vi- visit his friend Tedious and Erotica she says oh well I'm going to go out to my cooking class yeah sure and Lurkio in an aside to us as you're saying says she's lying she's going to meet the gladiator prodigious <laughs> or prod as he's <laughs> otherwise known hmm. the mistress oh. then uh, notes that everyone is leaving and says because everyone is leaving, Lurkio might as well have it off. <laughs> the night, that is. And he heads back outdoors. And now there's this series of conversations with the family members. And each one is asking him what he's going to do with his night off. And they're all urging him to go out, uh, enjoy himself. Yep. And they're even giving him spending money, Jeff. It's, he gets 10 drachma plus 10 drachma plus 10 drachma. God, that drachma. must be 30. Um, I think now, Steve, is also an extremely good time. Mm. We're going to play, my favourite, a round of What's It Worth Now? Oh, my goodness. Da, 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 which yeah. you always enjoy. We're going to find out what 10 drachma would buy you now. So 30 drachma. Yeah. Should I give you a guess or should I just drachma. steamroll through it? What's for five-year supply of... Oh, and I'm giving you spoilers here, listeners. This is a... Yeah. This is... 30 drachmas buys you a five-year supply of love potion. Yep. I would say a five-year supply of love potion these days would cost three to four hundred dollars. Right. In in which currents are? Well, say... Australian dollary dues. Dollary dues. Okay, so um, some sources say it's roughly five dollars US a drachma. So thirty of oh, those. Well, way off. Yeah. Well, it's two hundred and twenty dollary dues in today's currency. Oh, yeah, not too um, bad. Uh, which is one hundred and fifty US dollars. Uh, but if you're a British, uh, that's one hundred and twenty quid. Thirty drachma. I oh, was so for, for thirty drachma. <laughs> you know, you could have a pretty good night. He's been given all this oh, money to have so. a good night. And you go, oh, have a good night. Well, but, they each probably gave him enough to have a decent yeah, night, and then fifty bucks each. By the time US. you treble it, yeah, exactly. It's enough to go to the movies. 
<laughs> or yeah, go to well, the forum. Um, that's not saying much. The movies are pretty expensive. No, oh, they bloody are. And also, yeah, you've got to get your popcorn. And, oh, I'm going to. Yeah, it, it go comes out that. to about $50 a person, Steve. <laughs> what a rip. And the movies are all crap. <laughs> yes, well, I'll distract you from that by saying that, yes, so apparently at certain times, a half a drachma would be your day's pay, mm. and that would be enough to um, feed for a day your family of three. So the two adults and the kid or whatever. And I'd argue that $5 US isn't really enough to feed a family for a day. You know, no, no. I have so, so I'd value the drachma a bit higher, which might then bring it into that four hundred Australian mm. dollar do range that you're talking about. And yep. plus, then there's another way to calculate it, which would be how much weight of silver was in a drachma, and then compare that to today. And silver's just gone through the roof this year. Mm. Anyway, uh, and that's enough of that segment because I know everyone's rolling their eyes. All right. So coming back to um, the family's attempts to get rid of him for the night, he says, "I think they might be trying to get rid of me." <laughs> I think he could be right. Yeah. Yes. Um, now, you can just take it as read that there's jokes peppered through all of these conversations and it's pretty much non-stop. Then, a stranger comes over from next door and says that her mistress, Lucia, is going to come over and see Ludacris tonight, presumably to ask the senator mm-hmm. for a favour. Now, the clever slave, our Lurkio, mm-hmm. realises that Lucia, the neighbour, has never met Ludacris in person and won't know what he looks like. Oh, Meaning he can impersonate his master and turn the, turn this little situation to his advantage. Because if she wants a favour, then he needs favour in return. Exactly. Mm. Uh, so he intends to turn this situation to his advantage using a love filter, a.k.a. a love potion. Why do they say love filter, Steve? Uh, that's just what they called it, I think. Mm. I don't know why. Maybe it's because you see through rose-toloured <gasps> no, lenses right. or something like that. Mm-hmm. I'll mm. buy that. Yeah, so he can purchase such a thing with his pocket money he's just got, right? So he's off to see the apothecary. Uh, the apothecary is called Castor Oilus. Yes. Classic. Played by a guy called John Cater, mm-hmm. who's got a very long IMDb, but I didn't didn't put into our earlier section. Did you want to say anything before we... Yeah, totes, dude. On? I've got heaps of info on this bod. Yeah. Uh, because, again, my age obsession struck again, because he plays this bent-over old apothecary mm. who, like, to me, seems wizened. like he's in his 70s. Se- wizened is a perfect word mm. for it. He was 38, so he's doing a real Clive Dunn here and playing well yep. older than he actually is. And uh, he'd been in an episode of Dad's Army in the same year as Private Clark. Mm. Okay. And then it all twigged for me, because this episode of Dad's Army is where... Private Clark was in the sedan with Corporal Jones way back 50 years, you know, before uh, World War Two, when Dad's Army is set. And um, the story is that Clark had come to town to settle up with Jones, who had left him to die in the desert. And there's a whole, mm. it's quite an emotional episode. Yeah. But yeah, so, and he played, again, he aged up. So he was playing someone in his 70s in that episode. Yeah. At the age of, you know, his late 30s. Um, but huh. six years later, Steve, he was in I, Clavsdivs, otherwise oh, yeah. known as I, Claudius. Classic. Yeah. That's a fantastic show. So if I you're into if your they, Roman stuff. Oh, totally. I wonder if they cast him based on the strength of his up Pompeii appearance. Maybe. <laughs> uh, did you have more say on yeah, that? No, well, not on John. Yes. But on this apothecary on this scene. So scenario. I'll wait till you've let the scene play out. And yeah, then... so um, there is a lovely young assistant in the uh, the chemist. And uh, Lurkio seems quite embarrassed to come out and say what it is that he's chasing. Mm-hmm. So he goes through this whole series of hints, uh, none of which really hits the mark. But they get there eventually. And um, the instructions, this is important, uh, put one drop into wine. And mm-hmm. the whole uh, bottle that he's given is, like I said, it's enough to last five years. So, Oh, my goodness. Quite a long time. Mm. And when he's leaving, he says to the ever-acting apothecary, that's right, enjoy your last appearance on this show. Yeah. <laughs> Un- unlike the appearance. nice assistant you were talking about, so she plays different characters in something like seven episodes oh, really? of Up Pompeii. Mm. Mm. There you go. Soon enough, he re- Lurkio returns to the house. Now, before or... we get onto this, Steve, yes. I, I want to go down a slight tangent here. <laughs> now, when much... we saw him <laughs> at the beginning of the... Castor Oilus is mixing up his potion, right? Mm. And he's putting a drop of something disgusting in. Yeah. And he seems to be holding a dead rat and using its tail to stir the <laughs> yeah. potion. And this brought oh, me thinking about dead rats in comedy. Yeah. And I'll hand it over to you to tell us the most obvious dead rat comedy well, moment. No, I'll think of... 
the whole rat episode in news radio. You know, Blackadder and the Rato, Rato van. van. You can't go past you that. Saute or Fricato? Um, but no, the, also the classic other dead rat scene, culinary scene, oh, of Viv ones? emptying out yeah. the bin and go, oh, great, a dead rat. <laughs> Yes, we are. Unless I can think of some brilliant plan. Would you like some rat van to help you think? <laughs> rat o -ban. Yeah, it's rat that's been run, run over, over by, by a van. van. <laughs> What's this, Neil? Leftovers. <laughs> Neil, I hate you. Oh, yeah, that's right. Pick on me. I mean, I've already had personality hassles from a complete stranger today. Hey! There's a dead rat in there! Great! <laughs> mm. That's another episode we're going to have to do. Dead rats in comedy. <laughs> episode 250. Or rate, rate the, the top ten rats yeah. in... Obviously, they're in faulty towers as well. Oh, Basil the Rat. Our very first episode. Sitcom mm. showdown number oh, one. Oh, man. episode's writing itself. Bloody hell. Um, so before we leave the apothecary, the price is doing Lurkio's head in. You know, it's going to cost his whole 30 drachma just to mm. buy this potion. And so Castor Willis is trying to convince him to part with the money. He says, would you like to see my testimony? <laughs> Beware. It's all... Sorry, that tickled as me. Kate, that did. As Kate points out in the Upstart Crow episode, it's all a little bit questionable. Right. Yes, anyway. Moving on. He returns to the house, or I think it could be a condominium. I'm not sure. Anyway, he gets into his disguise as because he's trying to get himself across as the master of the house, right? Mm. The senator. Yep. So he's looking pretty spiffy, and he looks in the mirror and he calls himself a handsome devil that doesn't even need love potion. But then, to err on the side of caution, he decides to put a bit into the wine. So there's this bottle of wine which is going to feature heavily in the next, the next little right, bit. So I don't want to pull you up on a needless mm. detail here, Steve. But would you describe it as you know like a carafe? Yes. It's bigger than a bottle, really, isn't it? It's a big silver... Yep. I'm not sure what the term is, but it's big. It's, yeah, it's it's not a bottle of wine. Mm. Mm. Yeah, so he does put a bit into the wine. Uh, the idea being, listeners, that Lucia will have a drink and fall madly in love or lust with the next person that she sees, i.e. him. Well, that's the plan, anyway. It's a pretty straight-ahead plan. I yeah. mean, what can go wrong? This is What ridiculous. could possibly go wrong? And then he looks at the mirror a second time, loses a bit of confidence... And adds a bit more love potion to the wine. And I should mention that every time he adds a bit more, the bit more that he adds gets larger and larger. Uh, now it's nine grains of sand past seven. <laughs> that was and he cool. was expecting her at seven. Um, so she's late. And he says, never mind. Sick transit, Gloria Clapsum. I.e. the later they come, the harder they fall. <laughs> Which again isn't bad. Mm. Yep. Um, the doorbell rings and after adding a bit more love potion the wine and now it's all gone so a whole an entire five year supply has gone into this yeah i'm gonna say thing of wine it'd be a good 400 mil about a glass worth really and yeah. if a drop is what you should be adding to the wine holy moly yes it would be a large proportion of the yeah of the wine now anyway he makes lusher comfortable though she doesn't want any of the wine and after much flirty small talk we come to the point uh, of her visit, which is she's come to ask him if they can stop fixing the clothes, their clothesline to the corner of her house. <laughs> so a pretty big, pretty big favour to ask. And it's not quite the favour that he was hoping she'd ask. No. What do you think of me now? I think we shall be very good friends. Ah. You're so like my dear old father. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think things are going right. I think you'd better go out and come in again. If you oh, don't. no, I've upset you. I'm sorry. Oh. I'll leave now. No, don't. You can't leave now. I've got 30 drachmas invested in you. 30 drachmas? Yes. I don't get it. No, neither will I if you leave. Now, listen. <laughs> uh, do sit down. I'll tell you what. I'll, I'll go and remove the clothesline. And meanwhile, let me, let me proffer you a little dinky donks. Oh, no, really. Dinky, dinky <laughs> doo da donks. Come along. Oh, all right, then. If it will give you pleasure. Yeah, that's the general idea. <laughs> now, I haven't heard this clip as we're recording it, Steve, but clearly mm. the listener just has. Um, does this contain the absolutely fantastic line to, to us, the audience, promise yourself you'll turn off as I start to cut myself off a slice? No. <laughs> no? Okay. But I did, because I thought you'd like this one instead. Uh, talking about a drink. Yeah. He says, dinky, dinky, do da donks. <laughs> 
<laughs> look at look at my notes, Steve. The, what's the biggest word on that page? Dinky donks. Dinky donks. <laughs> I, I fell in love with dinky donks. Um, yeah, so it says here, like... Have I you asked your wife if she likes some dinky, dinky, yeah. doodle donks? <laughs> Go have a little dinky... <laughs> I can't even say it. Yeah. <laughs> now, this this brought me onto the Thin Blue Line. We're going into the Ben Elton heavily here. Patricia, you are demeaning the good name of Gasforth Police Force. I don't give a donkey's doodah for the Gasforth Police Force. <laughs> you do give a donkey's doodah. I don't give a donkey's doodah, and I'm going! <laughs> Could I offer you just a teensy wintle tittle of dinky donks? Oh. Dinky donks, dinky donky doodars. Well, I must say I could do with something or other. Yes, well, have the something first. <laughs> we'll talk about the other later. There's more Ben Elton taking some some donkey's doodah action. Mm. Who were? Yep, I'm not sure where to go next. Oh man! Oh, but... So I'm just thinking of all the, the all the years I missed out on saying the phrase "dinky donks." Imagine if I saw this when I was 15. I could have been oh. saying "dinky donks" for the last 35 years, and loving loving every time. Well, you got to make the most of it. Oh, I when hope you can, at so... your house now you say "dinky donks." <laughs> Anyone up for a bit of a little dinky donky doodah? <laughs> <laughs> That's Hall of Fame all on, on its own, dude. Yes. Well, I think, it, I think it should be clear what's going to happen next. Nauseus comes home, the young master, after his proposal has been refused. And, of course, he is the first one that Luscia sees. And she immediately starts chasing him around the house, and they exit. Then, after a knock on the door, Fair Ambrosia comes in looking for Nauseus. And this is Linda Barron, mm. with the aforementioned very short... Blue outfit. ...toga or whatever it is. Mm. Mm. And she's looking for Nauseus, because she's worried about him. And Lurkio pivots and he then starts work on plan B so he offers her a drink which she accepts and Lurkio goes to find Norseus because he's promised he'll go and try and find the young master for her and I think he says something along the lines of well it's fair enough you know he stole my bird so I'm gonna steal his something along those lines yeah mm. yeah and then of course the pattern repeats itself as Ludacris returns home with Flavia Ambrosia falls in love with him chases him then prodigious the gladiator arrives looking for erotica and waiting he sits has a glass of wine <laughs> and lurkio returns into the room and becomes the apple of his eye then he starts chasing lurkio down the street followed by erotica who has returned and finally ammonia comes back with her man on the side bumptious he drinks and falls in love with erotica ammonia drinks and falls in love with prod and the whole scene is complete chaos. There's people running everywhere. There's people running chasing everywhere. Chasing each other. Chasing each other. And Lurkio eventually blows a whistle to try and restore order. And then he, he's done. He goes out into the street and he's lamenting this turn of events. And he goes to tip out the rest of the troublesome wine so it can't cause any more chaos. Mm -hmm. And because he wants to then return to the prologue. But he can't find the, the troublesome wine. And he asks the audience if they took it. Yeah. That's one of the, the funnier sides that he does. He does um, talk to the audience a bit. So when uh, he has given the dinky donks to one of his prospective victim ladies, he comes back into the room and she's gone because she's now chasing after someone else. He says to the audience, you didn't take her, did you? Mm. And so, you know, as if she's wandered up there into the stands and all that. So there's lots yep. of lovely fourth wall breaking. Yeah. Yep. Um, but what you've missed out on there, Steve, and you probably omitted it because it's not worth mm. <laughs> talking about, but as he's blowing the whistle, because all four couples had come into the room and they've all sort of separately fallen onto this couch where they're all snogging each other. And then yeah. Frankie comes in, Lurkia, and he blows the whistle to just say, you know, pack it in, everybody. But then he says, half time, change sides. And then they all swap over. <laughs> and then he carries the football theme out into the thing and he goes, oh, what's the line? Oh, and he's blowing a whistle. No, no, he's not blowing the whistle, but he but says, like that's he's um, like no, no draws and four aways. <laughs> But oh, I, like... I didn't get that at all. Oh, dude, yeah. Well done, Jeff. No drawers, as in all the underwear is off. And ah. uh, four aways, as in they're getting their end away. So it's a beautifully neat well, and tight you, you football connected all those sex dots thing. The... Yeah, I did. Hmm. There you go. And considering I know nothing about the English soccer. Well, they call it football. I'll have you know. Just because they do it. Mm. Doesn't mean we bloody have to. No. Apparently the, the Yanks just discovered cricket. Oh, really? Mm. They're a bit behind, aren't they? Yeah, well, Crikey. they had a victory over... Pakistan, I think. <gasps> a, a very unlikely victory. So, uh, oh, we really went Be off helped. on a tangent there. Uh, 
Yeah, so he's trying to find this wine, and he's interrupted one more time by Senator the Soothsayer, and she was the one who drank, oh. took and drank the wine. Yes. And, of course, she's in love with Lurkio because he's the next, the first one she's seen. <laughs> and he starts getting chased by her. And, and he hates the soothsayer. Well, yeah, she's not up there he on called his her She's silly always interrupting drag or something. him. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. And uh, there is the end of the episode. Mm. Mm. So, for example, Molly Sugden, as she was Flavia, wasn't she? Yeah. She was a bit wasted in this. She was, you know, blink and you miss her and she's gone. Pretty much. Mm. Right. But pretty much all the guests. Had very little to do apart from look good and run around. True. Hmm. Where are we at? Yeah, so just to, before we start talking more, I just want to make it clear this is not a Hall of Fame nomination. Mm-hmm. We're here for interest's sake. Yeah. Only. I think we may have to have a discussion about the format of the show. <laughs> yeah. Because now it's a, it's a, no longer a sitcom era of explana- uh, exploration rather than nomination, mm. which I think it's is like fair. the Star Trek of yes. sitcom podcasts. Mm. <sighs> Uh, I've just got a list of things that I liked about it, really, to talk about. And mm-hmm. um, what have you got? Have you got well likes and dislikes? or Not as such, more observations. So, mm. for example, to me, and I don't mean this in a pejorative way, but it looks cheap. Yep. And if something's cheap to produce, then that's brilliant. Mm. And I think it's part of it because it's very stagey. And uh, so I think it totally fits in with the sitcom itself. And also it's just a bonus for making it is that it's cheap. And, uh, you know, no one does historicals better than the Beeb. Yeah. Well, I think we had three sets, or three, mm. the street, mm-hmm. the apothecary, which and would have been a, probably a one-off, and then the, the inside of the house would have been a standing set as well. Mm. So, yeah, very minimal. Yeah. And you can tell it's all pretty much painted cardboard. Yeah. Although there is a bit of depth to to the things, so that's... Oh, especially inside the house. Good. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can see beyond to the, well, whatever the outdoor courtyard... Yeah. And there's three or four doorways, which is brilliant for comings and goings, especially useful in this episode. Yep. Yep. But the, having said that about the sets, the costumes are, I thought they are really good Mm. colours and stuff like that. And And it helps if you've got good thighs. There's a lot of thigh in this show. Yep, certainly a lot of that. Mm. Mm. What else did you like or what other observations did you have? Well, I like talking to the audience. Mm. This is probably the most I've ever seen in a show. Oh. So, you know, because he literally is spending more than half his time actually talking directly to us. And in a way, I think, you know, well, a thought that occurred to me as I was watching it is I love listening to podcasts and YouTube channels that talk about shows quite often more than watching the show itself. Mm. So I'm more than happy to tune into someone talking about the latest episode of whatever show it is and not actually watch the bloody show. And I think I'm getting the best of both worlds here because mm-hmm. he's telling us what's going on with the show. He's making observations about the characters just like a YouTube commenter would. Yep. But he's actually also in the show. And it's, you know, the only drawback to that, even though I really like it, is, of course, every time then he turns to us and all that, it puts the brakes on the plot. And sometimes you're thinking, ah, oh, just get on with it. You know, mm-hmm. you don't have to... But those, those times were rare. But no, I, I, I like it. I like all the fourth wall breaking. I like him talking to us. I thought that was really cool. Mm. There's both, <clears throat> and I wonder if these are different things, there's both asides to the audience and fourth wall breaking. Mm-hmm. Like there's a couple of ca- occasions where he's clearly telling you that, you know, we're making a TV, we're making a TV show here, you know. Yeah. Like when and he's then, saying, yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, That's you're the last time you'll be on the show. You'll never appear yeah. on this show again. Which but, is quite a different thing to talking to the audience. Mm-hmm. That's right. Because that audience could be back then, if you know what I mean. like observers of what's actually happening. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, it's interesting that they have both things going on in the same show. I totally agree. Mm. What else? Oh, that's it. Over to you. Okay. Um, I like the simple descent into farce and people running around and shouting. Yeah, the pace picked up, didn't it? It Big time. Yep. Uh, And I like that Lurkio, his plans were foiled. And, well, I think every... Pretty much everyone's plans were foiled in this, in yeah. this episode. No one really got what they wanted. But yeah, that was that was nice. I like a historic sitcom and the fact that this draws on influences from the period like Plautus we talked about, uh, how the play or the musical and this one both uh, draw upon him. We've got the Romans being hedonistic, which they're, of course, known for, and they were into their love potions. So it pulls in these kind of things and Latin mistranslations are pretty, they were pretty fun. And then there's also the Shakespearean side of it, uh, like mm. the failed prologue and the asides to camera. 
breaking the fourth wall, which we've already talked about. Uh, it's an interesting mix of like low brow and high brow it stuff is. going on. Yeah. Mm. You've got these eye rolling, groan worthy jokes that still have merit and they're quite innocent and you could find them in a kid's show, but then you've got all the source as well. So it's a real mix of all sorts of stuff. Yep. And I think the, the way they deal with double entendres is pretty funny where he delivers it with a straight face to the audience as if he doesn't know what he's doing. But then when they giggle at what he says, he says, oh, you know, that's not what I meant. You've got a dirty mind, all this sort of stuff. So that's yeah, kind of an interesting way of approaching that. Uh, and yeah, I always thought he's, Frankie's delivery is very good. He's very relaxed. There's a weak joke deliberately put in there and then he'll play on how bad the joke has just been and all that sort of stuff. Make the most of it. Yeah. So all in all, I thought it was just... A fun watch. Pretty entertaining, yeah. Yeah. So I totally agree. I wonder if I'd rather watch an episode of Up Pompeii or an episode of Chelmsford 123. Mm. Yeah, I was and thinking about be... Chelmsford 123. Mm. It's a very mixed bag, Chelmsford 123, because there's some mm. episodes that are just great, but on the main, you know, there's a few that miss the mark. Well, uh, we'll have to talk the... about one of the ones mm. that is better. All right, well, I think we've pretty much run to the, the end of uh, everything we wanted to say about that, so... Mm. Should the listeners check it out? I reckon so. I mean, yeah. I was very happy you brought it to the table. Really enjoyed it, and I'm glad you brought it along. Oh, good. Glad to hear that. Mm. It's interesting that there was only two series, but it had all these spin-offs and specials and got turned into mm. other other shows as well. So uh, I guess the normal measure of success is how many seasons a thing does, but I think in this case, maybe it should be measured by all these other things that, how many got, spin-offs that became got? down the track. Mm. I'd say it was a success. Yeah, well, and, and there's it made Frankie two Howard's reasons. Career, so. Oh, that's true. Mm. Sorry, I was just going to say that that could be for two separate reasons. So something can be really good and you can spin stuff off it or something can be just such a versatile format that mm. can work anywhere. It can work on stage, it can work on TV, it can work on film. It's cheap to produce and maybe for that reason it had a lot of, you know. Oh, yeah, yeah. Mm. Mm. All right, well, uh, we shall return in a month or so. I feel almost guilty saying that now because it's, all, it's, it's always usually about a month six weeks now. Yeah, yeah. Let's That's be right. realistic. It's uh, it's about quality, not quantity. Yes. <laughs> Never mind the quality; you feel the width. Yeah, yeah. Uh, all right. So, um, Jeff, have you got any idea of what you're bringing to the table next time? No, to be perfectly honest, no. However, we have had suggestions, and I do keep threatening to follow through on the um, not going out suggestion. Mm -hmm. So uh, apparently that's reached quite the milestone. I right. will have to look into that, and it's a strong possibility. All right. Well, we'll uh, see you. We'll be talking to you. Next time. Yeah, in about six weeks. Bye. Bye. Join us next time on Sitcom Showdown when we'll be putting another five-star episode under the microscope. And in the meantime, you can contact us with feedback on Facebook, Twitter at Sitcom Showdown, or by email sitcomshowdown at gmail.com. <laughs>